Good afternoon. Uh, welcome uh, attendees, including our presenters, to this uh, Churchill Fellowship information session. This is uh, themed for emergency response information and related uh, fields and topics. Um, of course, we may have people tuning in who uh, are interested in work in other fields, and that's fine. You just want to find out a bit more about uh, Churchill Fellowships and how you might uh, apply this year. My name is Adam Davey. I'm the CEO of the Winston Churchill Trust, uh, based here in Canberra, Ngunnawal country. I'm going to begin this information session with an overview of what Churchill Fellowships are all about, how you apply, and the sorts of things we're looking for. Uh, before we do that, I would like to acknowledge Australia's First Nations people, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, any Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islanders tuning in uh, today. Um, I want you to know that we actually have a relatively new Indigenous Churchill Fellows Network that's established, and um, there's some really uh, strong support there uh, from our organisation and from those fellows, and we have a... Uh, a session organised in a week or so um, specifically for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, fellows um, to get some uh, advice from our alumni. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you will be able to submit questions via the Q&A function. Um, if you miss your chance or if you think of questions later on, uh, you can contact us directly via um, our website um, or via phone or social media. Um, I would like to acknowledge the very difficult times we're living through. Um, you know, the COVID pandemic has certainly been challenging globally and here in Australia. Um, there's been a lot of disruption and uncertainty and suffering and death. Uh, more recently, we've had these terrible uh, floods uh, again. Um, we've had bushfires. And I know a lot of you tuning in today have uh, had uh, involvement in um, directly in supporting or perhaps being directly affected by these uh, circumstances. So I do thank you for all of your uh, work in that area. Uh, we've got two Churchill Fellows speaking today, uh, Tim Day, um, who's a 2018 Churchill Fellow and Bronnie McIntosh, who's a 2015 Churchill Fellow. And um, it's gonna be really interesting to hear from them about what they did their fellowships on and uh, the path they've taken. So, um, I'll move into the uh, background about Churchill Fellowships. And one of the questions that I'm, I'm often asked is, where does the funding come for Churchill Fellowships? And that's a good question. And there's uh, a bit of history here. And I encourage you to go online and, and our website to learn more about the history of the Trust and Sir Winston Churchill. Um, but in a nutshell, when Winston Churchill resigned as British Prime Minister, in 1955, he was 80 years of age. He'd served under five reigning monarchs. He'd survived three wars, had been a writer, an historian, a painter, an adventurer, a journalist. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1953. So there was a widespread desire to honor the great man and capture the essence of his public service, of his inspiration, his intellect, and even his humor for generations to come. Now, it wasn't perfect, and, and you can read some insightful essays on our website that we've commissioned that explore Churchill through a contemporary lens. But he was a man who readily believed that anything was possible if you put your mind to it, and that the greatest figures in history were those who made a contribution to public service and to their fellow countrymen. So when the Prime Minister at the time, Sir Robert Menzies, announced the news of Sir Winston's death, uh, in January 1965, he simultaneously announced a public uh, a, a appeal, a fundraising appeal. And we call it Churchill Memorial Sunday, uh, 28th of January 1965. There was a door knock appeal supported by around 220,000 Australians with support from the Return Services League. And that fundraising door knock combined with government and business support raised uh, about 2.2 million pounds or about $4 million. And that money has been uh, carefully uh, invested um, and we've received and still do receive bequests and donations. And so that uh, money is in, uh, invested to keep the trust going in perpetuity. And we use the uh, proceeds from the investments to pay for the fellowships each year, which is about you know, 3.2 or so million dollars, depending on, 
on the year. Uh, so that's where the money comes from. It's, it's really the People's Trust and uh, the Churchill Fellowships are, are for all Australians. So the attributes of a Churchill Fellow, that's another question that I get asked. You know, what, what are you looking for in terms of applicants? Well, Churchill Fellows are typically people who are passionate and committed to a particular issue or, or a cause or, you know, their field. Um, they want to learn and share knowledge so that they can bring that back for the communities to benefit. So that could quite possibly be any of you tuning in today. And we invest in people as much as we invest in their ideas. Now, Churchill Fellowship is unique and a prestigious opportunity open to Australians from all walks of life. So it's not an academic scholarship. Uh, it's not a funding grant. A fellowship's not just an overseas trip. It's a start of a lifelong journey and your contribution to make Australia better. A Churchill Fellowship does not need to comprise formal research. You can learn new skills, build networks and observe best practice in your chosen field. So you can undertake a course. It doesn't have to be uh, formal research at all. Um, but it can also be formal research if you want it to be. The fellowship is for overseas travel only and has to be between four to eight weeks taken in one continuous journey. There are some exceptions to that that I'll cover shortly. We've awarded nearly 4,500 Churchill Fellowships since 1965, and each year we aim to award around 100 or so more. Last year was the first time we haven't run a fellowship round since our existence, and that was due to COVID and international travel effectively being shut down. So we, we wanted to um, make sure we didn't have too many people queued up uh, to travel. So we've got um, effectively two years worth of fellows traveling this year. So it's gonna be quite busy um, for us on that front. So Churchill Fellows travel across the globe on the widest range and depth of topics and bring back to this country information, networks, projects, products, ideas, and innovation that make this country even stronger. Hi, Bronnie, I can see Bronnie's joined us. Uh, so in terms of personal eligibility, uh, you need to be an Australian citizen or as of uh, this year, a permanent resident um, of Australia. And you have to be over the age of 18 by the application closing date, which is the 28th of April. The ability to travel overseas is essential uh, and we can provide support for you if you have a disability. Now, I've been asked um, a few times now, do I need to be vaccinated against COVID? Well, you know, we don't put that requirement on you but we do have a requirement that you travel overseas. So if you can't meet the requirements to travel overseas set by um, various countries, which may include vaccination, um, then obviously you won't be able to undertake your church or fellowship. So that's gonna be quite important um, if you're successful. We also offer virtual research options for people who cannot travel due to disability or caring responsibilities. So that's something new. Um, and if that's you, please come and talk to us. Um, so that we can ensure that that's a consideration for your application. Another new thing is for people living in remote parts of Australia, we will soon be allowing domestic travel. Um, and that's based on feedback we've had that it can be quite challenging if you live in remote parts of Australia to get the experience and knowledge that's already within Australia, let alone traveling overseas. Um, so if that's you, uh, please get in contact with us to discuss as well. If you're undertaking tertiary studies, or if you're at, say, university, um, that's okay. However, your proposed project can't directly form part of that study. Um, we do expect you to commit 100% to your Churchill Fellowship, uh, including your report and your efforts once you return to implement your findings and recommendations. So I'd suggest if you're undertaking a PhD, you'd probably need to put that on hold because you're gonna be pretty busy and we want you to focus on your church or fellowship, not just for the duration of your travel overseas, but when you come back, we need you to see you trying to get some impact with what you learnt. So it's important that you hear today that a church or fellowship is an opportunity for people from all walks of life. And that's a phrase that we hear lots of times around the place, but for us, it's really our mantra and it, it's the ethos. It goes to the heart of what a church or fellowship is about. Now your project, you know, obviously needs to be suitable for a church or fellowship. And by that, 
you know, it must benefit the community in some way. So you need to explain to us how bringing back and sharing your knowledge, your ideas, practices or skills uh, will benefit the community. You must demonstrate that you've fully explored the topic or the issue within Australia to be considered for a church or fellowship. So by that, what we're looking for is uh, that you have identified there is no one in Australia doing certain things uh, the way that you're, you're uh, wanting to see them done or the way that could get results that you've identified overseas. There are people doing things a bit differently or getting different results. Therefore, you need to go over there. We don't want to pay to send you overseas if you can already learn what you'll be learning within Australia. So hopefully that makes sense to you. The project has to be a self-contained project. So I mentioned before, it can't be part of your um, tertiary studies, uh, but also it can't be partly funded by another organisation. So we're not here to be an external travel uh, budget for your organisation's project. Um, really, a tertiary fellowship is a standalone project. It's uh, generously funded, uh, but we need your dedication and commitment. And that will come through uh, in your application, I think, and when you're interviewed, we'll, we'll see that you're passionate about doing this, that it's not just a, a sort of work project. And we don't, um, we don't check to see that uh, your employment and your project have to be connected. They often are, and that's okay. And for obvious reasons, people work in areas that they're passionate about or they become passionate about areas they work in. But you might have a project that's not related to your employment, and that's, that's perfectly fine. That's not a prerequisite. We don't set limits on the topics or issues um, that you want to study. And that, I think, really is what makes us uh, unique as an award. So you really do design um, your own project. If you can think of a suitable um, topic, then there are no limits. We do offer some uh, what we call sponsored uh, fellowships where generous individuals or organisations uh, have agreed to fund a fellowship on a particular topic or a particular issue or, or for a particular um, recipient. And uh, this doesn't mean they're always awarded, but it means that we're always looking for applicants in those particular topic areas. So, for example, perhaps related to this theme today, there's the Bob and June uh, Cricket Churchill Fellowship on topics relating to national disasters or nat natural disasters. Um, so when you're applying, um, you'll get the opportunity to choose one or two sponsor fellowships that you'd like to be considered for. I should say, look, it makes no difference to how you're, you're assessed. You're all assessed on a level, level playing field. And by ticking one of those boxes or selecting one of those fellowships, it won't mean that you're not considered for a normal standard church or fellowship. You certainly will be. But it does help us ensure that we can allocate um, of the successful fellows, people to those sponsor fellowships where they're a match, and that's really important to us. Um, we'll also check through all the applications and see if someone's a good fit. So even if you didn't tick a box, we'll still consider you um, and possibly allocate you to a sponsor fellowship if you, you or your project are a good fit. So naturally, um, you apply um, online now, and we've got an um, application form that you can log into and log out of to your heart's content. Um, updating bits and pieces as you go. So what I suggest is um, if you're interested uh, in applying and you haven't yet, go online, uh, create an account, uh, start having a look through the form, uh, have a good idea of what the questions look like and you can start um, refining your application. Um, if the online form is a barrier to you um, because of uh, a disability, for example, and you, you just can't use the form because uh, it's not accessible to you, please let us know, we'll find a solution. Um, we don't want anyone uh, turned away because they can't fill out a form because that would be a bit ridiculous. Um, remember, you're competing against all other applicants. Um, so think about how are you going to convince the selectors to invest in you and your project idea? You're going to need two references. You, you need one reference, who, one referee who can vouch for your personal characteristics, you know, your aptitude, your attitude, your sort of um, approach to, to your um, life and to the way you tackle projects, your passion, and someone who's an authority in your topic or field so they can lend credibility and effectively say, yes, this issue is a serious issue and I'm speaking from some position of authority in this area. Engage these people early. 
um, they submit their, their uh, referees uh, comments through your application. They'll get emails and they go on and they submit them online. Uh, it's important that you get in contact with them early and make sure they'll be available to do your reference um, before the closing date. It's probably the number one uh, cause of stress with applications is on the closing day, people call in a panic because their referee is gone on holidays and they can't reach them and they haven't done their reference. And that's um, pretty frustrating for the applicant because you can't extend the deadline. So get in early. Um, Churchill Fellows tell us time and again that going through that process of filling out that, the application form really helps them distill their thinking and refine their ideas. So again, get in early, start your application. Um, you can keep going in and editing it and refining it. You've got plenty of time. Um, so don't waste time. Uh, if you leave it to the last minute, it's not gonna be your best application. So the form is fully automated. It won't let you progress. If you haven't filled out something, it'll let you know what's going on. So it seems to be running very smoothly. If you have any issues, you can uh, call the office um, for some assistance. So your itinerary, we do get lots of questions about the itinerary. So you really need to think carefully about your itinerary, which uh, destinations, which countries, which cities, which people or organizations do you wanna meet with? Why do you wanna meet with them? What do you hope to learn or observe um, when, when you're there? So you won't have the answers necessarily. So I don't know what I don't know, but you should have a good idea of why you want to go and meet with these people or these organizations. Don't overcrowd your itinerary. It's really important that you leave some time. So in the form, you'll be asked to put a, a country, a city, an organization or person, what you want to do and the duration. So it might be five days, 10 days in that location. Don't uh, cut it really short and do yourself a disservice. You might find there's meetings that pop up when you're in that particular country and city and you need to have some uh, padding in your time there to allow you to make those meetings. We also don't want you run ragged. You need to have weekends. You need to take time to, to understand the culture, the context of where you are, be a bit of a tourist um, to understand why they do things the way they do them there. So that's a good piece of advice. Don't try and cram too many destinations into your, your fellowship itinerary. We'll only let you go to places that Smart Traveller lets you go, and that can change over time. So we'll deal with that if things change. Um, it does need to be one continuous journey between four to eight weeks. Um, so it's not uncommon. It's more typical that people get an around the world ticket as part of their, their fellowship. Um, can you uh, stay a bit longer if you fund it yourself and have a holiday at the end? Yes, you can. Uh, can your family join you? Um, yes, if you pay for their airfares, absolutely. And, and the extra cost for them attending. Um, there is some coverage under the insurance that we provide for family members, as long as they're with you. If they split off and, and go to another country on a holiday, you'll need to organize uh, insurance for them. But it's, um, it's flexible in the sense that, you know, you're, you're allowed to um, add extra things on to your fellowship if you have the time and the money to do that. Um, we don't advise you to have a break in the middle of your fellowship. So if you've gone for six or eight weeks, we don't suggest you have a break in the middle. Um, partly because it can disrupt the flow of your research project and partly because we've had people uh, have accidents skiing and things like that and then they have to come back to Australia and it's really difficult to find time again to set off on your fellowship. So it really is a great way to ruin um, your fellowship opportunity. Uh, COVID, well, look, as you know, it completely stopped international travel. The world is slowly opening up. We've got uh, fellows overseas at the moment. Someone left yesterday. We had someone leave for the US a week ago. Um, so it's, it's happening, um, which is great. Uh, it's not like it used to be. You have to really pay attention um, to the different rules uh, and regulations around traveling. But if you're successful this year, you won't travel until 2023. So hopefully things are um, smoother um, by that time. So the selection process, we have um, selection panels in each state and territory comprising uh, people from across a range of fields and sectors. Um, applications are shortlisted, taking into account referee comments and interviews are held to help determine who will be recommended for a church or fellowship. We prefer people to attend these interviews in person, but we can accommodate video interviews by exception. And as you'd expect in 2020, all of our interviews were done uh, via video due to uh, COVID lockdowns. If you look at our website, the selection process 
uh, map is there that includes all the dates that have been set for interviews. So you can um, pencil them in if you're feeling confident. Uh, about half of those people interviewed are likely to receive fellowships. So if you do get an interview, um, that's a significant achievement. In New South Wales and Victoria, due to the number of applications we get, there's two rounds of interviews, so a, a first interview and a second interview. So it is uh, a very competitive process. In previous years, we've typically got between 1,000 and 1,100 applications. And as I said, awarded you know, 105 to 110. So the odds are pretty good, but it is a competitive process. Final recommendations go to our board and you'll be informed if you're successful, if you've made it down that far um, in September. So I often ask for tips about the application process. And the best tip I can give you is to read and address the selection criteria. Use as little jargon as possible. Assume, despite the fact we've got a range of different people sitting in our selection committees, assume they don't know what you're talking about and they don't know your acronyms, they don't know your jargon. So use plain English spell it out in a really succinct and clear way. So look, remember it is a competitive process. Church of Fellowships are prestigious, they're well-funded and they're highly contested. But that's not a reason to be shy. It's a reason to put forward the best effort you can into your application. So you'll be competing against everyone else who lodges an application. And most of you will satisfy the criteria. It's how well you satisfy that criteria that'll make the difference and ultimately decide whether or not you're successful. So think about how you can make your application stand out. Make sure, you know, if there is the possibility for painting the picture of a burning platform that needs to be addressed and why that you are the person that should be doing that, um, that's what you should think about. So here's our phone number if you haven't already got it and our website address. Um, please take the opportunity to talk uh, to the Trust uh, if you have any questions. There are a small team here and there's always someone um, ready and willing to answer your questions. So that's uh, the overview and hopefully we've got some questions and we'll answer them um, at, at the end. So I'm now going to introduce our uh, first speaker for this evening, uh, Tim Day. Tim is, uh, was awarded his fellowship in 2018 uh, in Victoria. And his um, fellowship was to examine the operating models of international homicide squads to build our national capability. So whilst I uh, bring the slides up, Tim might turn his camera on and uh, do a quick introduction. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Adam. And um, thank you, everybody. And I really do appreciate um, the opportunity to speak to you all this evening in relation to the Churchill Fellowship. Um, Adam, can I just confirm you um, you have me on audio and camera? Yep, no problems. Great, thank you. Uh, I too wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, the land which we virtually meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I myself am, uh, am on Bunurong land at present and, um, and I thank the Churchill um, Trust for inviting me this evening. I'm very honoured to firstly be a Churchill recipient from 2018 and indeed honoured to, um, to speak to you this evening. Um, if I could start with indicating that, um, I guess, to give you a little bit of my background, it might assist in terms of uh, what I'm going to speak about this evening. Um, so I'm a superintendent of police with, uh, with Victoria Police. So I've been a member of the police force for 31 years. Um, and uh, joined in 1991, so straight out of university with a science background and um, initially joined Big Pole um, with a view to doing, um, to being a forensic scientist. And when I joined Victoria Police and after the first six to 12 months or so realised, actually, I think, I think I actually like the idea of catching crooks and I like the idea of being a detective and um, fell into that, that field. And, the science sort of took a bit of a, a sidestep and, um, and then I focused my career on criminal investigation and, as I said, being a detective. And that in itself uh, morphed later in my career after doing some time in local criminal investigation units and, and the drug squad and clandestine laboratory unit where I'd used the science to that interest in homicide investigation. So in 2000, I started as a, my first stint at the Homicide Squad in Victoria as a senior detective, spent five years doing 
I guess, the contemporary homicides that you do um, uh, day to day, and then uh, cold case homicides as well. Short period of time out of the squad from 2005 to 2007, where I came back in and spent another five years as a, as a teams and crew supervisor, as a detective sergeant, detective acting senior sergeant. Out again as a station commander for a few years and as a um, and doing some inspector work outside in some anti-corruption fields before I couldn't get enough of it and was very fortunate to be given the opportunity to come back as the head of homicide for Victoria from 2017 to December last year. So I've just finished as a detective inspector and head of homicide for Victoria. So that gives you a little bit of my background, 15 years out of 31 doing homicide. So can I have my next slide, please, Adam? So why my fellowship? Um, in 2017, when I started at Homicide, um, again, for the third tour, um, I guess what I saw was a squad that was suffering significantly under, under the burden, I guess, of load, under the burden of um, a significant caseload. Um, the members were... Um, struggling in terms of having bandwidth to undertake their investigations. We were seeing, without doubt, um, not just that increase in caseload ratio to the point where each member was carrying um, somewhere upwards of 12 to 13 homicide investigations at a time, but a reduction in our solve rate down into the low 80, 80th percentile, the first time that Victorian homicide had seen that for, um, for living memory. Now, um, that comes on the back of the fact that most homicide squads within Australia and in particular Victoria hold some of the greatest solve rates in the world. And um, so from that, the question obviously was why? Why was that happening? The health and wellbeing impacts on the membership um, was evident um, and the effects on community safety were evidence and community confidence. So it was a pretty, pretty easy question to ask and a pretty easy question to start researching. Um, and that is, why was it happening? So, of course, I had an understanding what I thought or a belief developed a hypothesis that um, why it was occurring and it was around that caseload ratio and the number of investigators versus the number of investigations we had. Um, and I set about looking around the country as to why that was and it, it was pretty clear that all jurisdictions around Australia were suffering the same issues, some to a greater degree than others. Um, and so once I had exhausted that Australian context in terms of how we could improve in Victoria, it was about looking further abroad. And Adam, if I could have the next slide, that would be great. So I started doing effectively the desktop research around what it was that made homicide squads ticked. How was it that that some homicide squads could have a solvability rate in the 90% range, others were suffering in around the 30% the range. So what I set out to do was to try and explore not just, not just squads that had high solve rates, but I was looking for squads that also had low solve rates. And then I had that was the sort of, I could allow that variable to occur to try and do the contrast and compare. But the key piece around it was to say, okay, um, what what is the constant I'm going to use in so that I could bring all the research together and that was looking at jurisdictions that generally um, mirrored our own to some degree of course whether they were an adversarial criminal justice system as opposed to an inquisitorial criminal justice system and or predominantly English speaking so that I could bring the research together so my plan was to examine the operating models of international homicide squads to build our national capability and try and provide answers to all of those squads as to why our solvability was reducing and, the, and the, the health and well-being of our staff was declining. So I set out uh, to examine 11 jurisdictions uh, in four countries on two continents. That was the Netherlands, um, the Met, uh, Metropolitan Police in London in the UK, six jurisdictions in the US, including the FBI, uh, the Metropolitan Police in Washington, the NYPD, um, San Francisco, LAPD and Las Vegas PD primarily. And there were nuances around why I chose certain, um, certain uh, jurisdictions. Las Vegas, for example, because of the mass casualty shooting out of um, the Mandalay Hotel. Um, uh, NYPD because of the 
the ability they had in the um, through the Bratton and Giuliani days to, um, to reduce their crime rates. Um, in Canada, the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, because of their, they've long been regarded as, the, as some of the most innovative um, or the most innovative police force in the world. And then also in Canada, it was Toronto and a little place called Peel, which has one of the highest solve rates in, um, in the world. As I said, I did eight weeks overseas, uh, no sleep. Um, and I echo some of uh, Adam's commentary before. Uh, be very careful, I would say, about what you choose and you uh, you you try to bite off. Um, it can be exhausting. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please, Adam. Um, the major highlights, um, as it indicates there on the slide, engaging with some of those iconic homicide squads around the world, the Met, NYPD, LAPD, San Francisco PD, the RCMP, to name a few, a real highlight. Um, Realising that there were shared and common goals and challenges amongst all of those homicide investigation units around the world. We were, um, when you travel around Australia, you realise that um, police are all the same. Um, police have all of the same challenges. And then when you travel broadly across the globe, you realise it's the same. Um, and building those lifelong professional and personal relationships and, um, and as, I, as I say there on the slideshow, the special trip home, because I was very fortunate, as Adam had indicated, I, had my, I initially did my first five weeks of the eight weeks I was away, five and a half weeks by myself, uh, which allowed me to get the bulk of the Churchill um, research done and not be distracted. And then when I got onto the west coast of the US, my wife and two daughters flew over and they could do that last piece of the West Coast with me from San Francisco, LA and, and Las Vegas, which was fantastic. And the story here is, of course, as it says, thanks to John Cagney at San Francisco PD, I was very, very fortunate to um, uh, his, um, the father of his, so, um, his son's girlfriend, I think it was something like that, happened to be a United pilot. So we hop on the plane at LA, the four of us, thinking that we're about to have a the economy trip home back from LA back to Australia. And the next thing, um, the four of us just sitting up in business class for the trip home, which was uh, really, really, really nice. So um, Adam, if I could have the next. And uh, yeah, the slideshow in front of you, probably just to, just to, rather than it being just all words, um, as I said, the, the relationships, professional and personal relationships, which I hold very dear and, and coppers being coppers, um, as I said, we're all the same. Um, I still connect with these people on a, on a weekly basis, even now that I'm not the OSC homicide, whether it be on the top left from LAPD through the Met, through New York, the RCMP, which you can obviously tell with the big bison head there, it's um, it's it was a, an amazing experience and amazing people to meet. Adam, if yeah, if I could have the next Adam, thank you. Okay, so I've been asked to speak to you also about something unexpected. What was it that that I didn't expect to see when I went, and what surprised me and the like, and that was that I've touched on, we are all the same. We all face the same issues and we're all striving to find better ways to solve crime and create safer communities. That's in some ways, it was unexpected, I guess, the level that that um, and the extent to which that was the norm. Um, and so that the level of that was unexpected to me. However, it was the, the preconceived ideas around solvability that, that got flipped on its head for me. So when I did my research in Australia, from what I knew in Victoria and the research in Australia, my firm belief that it was around caseload ratio, the numbers of investigators we would have in the squads. So for example, Western Australia had effectively three times as many investigators that Victoria had and about a third the load and therefore had higher solvability. So that's the sort of thing that I'm thinking that it's about. I'm thinking that it's about our technical capability around our ability to um, use intel sources, intelligence sources and the like. But it was actually something that I didn't expect to see. And that was primarily, it was around the contract of trust. The contract of trust that we have 
with our community. It was understanding that, for example, Australians and the way we as police forces engage with our community, that we as a community engage with our um, with authorities within this within this country, the trust that the government has with community, um, even post COVID, um, the trust that the organisation has and the ability for us to go to a door and say to someone, um, there's been a shooting in your street, what did you see? And for them to trust the organisation and their police force to sign up to a statement and give evidence in the witness box uh, was something that is that in Australia is quite different to other jurisdictions. Every, almost without fault, every jurisdiction overseas, when asked what is your greatest challenge to solvability, it was community assistance. And that did not resonate for any jurisdiction in Australia. It was around caseload ratio, number of investigators and like. So that was that unexpected thing that flipped on my head around how both important and fragile that contract of trust, how, how important that is to our policing jurisdictions and to what we do to try and nurture that and protect it. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So what would I do differently? Um, if, if I could have the next slide, please, Adam. I'm not sure if uh, if I've lost Adam or not. Adam, can I just confirm? Can you still hear me? Yep, I can hear you. I've changed the slide. Great. Things Sorry, I'm, I'm, just not, I'm not seeing it, but that's fine. That's right. fine. I'll just keep going along. Um, no. Okay. Things are things I would do differently. Okay. I would prepare more. I would do more prior. Um, I would develop my concept um, and thinking more before leaving. Um, and when I say that, I mean that whilst it's okay to have preconceived ideas um, and to develop your hypothesis before you go, it's really important that as Adam had indicated, that you exhaust the church or first and go overseas first. Try and get to a point where you've almost exhausted what you need to do in the country, in Australia, before you go overseas. When you get overseas, do less over there. Um, the mistake I think that I made um, was 11 jurisdictions in eight weeks meant that I effectively travelled a day, two days of research, a day of writing, a day of rest, a day, and then back on the merry-go-round, a day of travel, two days of the jurisdiction, a day of riding, a day of rest back on the merry-go-round. Allow more time to smell the roses and hypothesise, conceptualise, deviate, explore both personally and professionally uh, the jurisdiction or the, the area that you're in and really help shape your thinking while you're over there. You need time to do that. Um, if we can... Can I change the slide, please, then? Churchill Fellow. Um, and I apologise. I don't. I can't see the screen that you may well be seeing, ladies and gentlemen. But best um, thing about being a Churchill Fellow. Thank you, Adam. So networks within the Churchill Fellowship. That is without doubt for me one of the, the greatest wins. Pick up the phone. Well, I did until I left Homicide in December to pick up the phone if I've got a problem where I can ring a jurisdiction on the other side of the world and say, I need this done and I need it done now, as opposed to going through um, the, the rig rigmarole and the bureaucracy to try and have mutual assistance done um, officially. Um, that truly that feeling is one of the best experience in your life can make a difference. That understanding, that, that sense of warmth, I guess, in yourself, understanding that, you know, such a great personal and professional experience has such an impact on your community when you get home. And enacting that, that enacting change such as the cold case hub that we now have attached to Victoria Police's outward facing website, uh, brought back from Toronto, um, that can really help us drive, uh, drive our business and solve homicides. Next slide, please, Anna. And of course, it's not just all about 
work. It's also about having some fun and drinking some beer, meeting some great people, eating well, enjoying your time because it um, it is a great once in a lifetime experience. Um, next slide, please, Adam. It's um, it is something that you really should cherish and give yourself permission to enjoy. Key preparation and travel pieces. I think you should have in front of you now. It's a second last slide as I'm about to wrap up. My my advice would be prior to your application, do more prior, formulate your views, consider your travel towards the end, not the start. As I said, I initially was thinking of uh, putting in about 2016, uh, realised, as Adam had indicated, once I started the process of application, realised, oh, I need to still distill some views here and, and I don't think I've finished in country before I go overseas, which then delayed me another year. And when I say delayed, I mean it was for the better allowing me to develop my thinking more before traveling. See your accountant. There are tax implications. You need to know when to spend your money, when not to, how to maximize your funds and minimize your tax, really important. I'm not an accountant, recommend go and see an accountant. Start to construct your report and your preamble on your Australian research well before you go. You should be able to, um, to really develop your report around well, how you've exhausted your Australian research and start probably constructing your overseas research based on clearly the research and understanding you'll need to decide where you're going to go. Really important to do as much of that before you go as you can. And whilst travelling, allow time to write on the road whilst it's fresh in your mind. I'm, if I hadn't have done that, the, the difficulty in writing when I got home would have been immense. And then finally, as it says there, take time to smell the roses, be kind to yourself and, you'll let, and allow yourself time to enjoy it. Next slide, please, Adam. As my, the final word, as my wife says, none of us are getting out of here alive. Prepare well, work hard, but enjoy the experience. Um, it is truly one of my life's greatest experiences and I would highly recommend it to all of you, something that you both, both personally and professionally um, you'll look, you'll look back on as as one of the highlights of your life. So thank you for your time. Great, thanks so much, Tim. That was fabulous. Um, really interesting, and hopefully many of you are familiar with the work that uh, Tim's implemented with that cold case um, community uh, outreach. It, it sounds fantastic, and I think it's already um, achieving some great results. So I'd like to introduce uh, our second speaker, um, uh, Bronnie McIntosh, who was awarded her Churchill Fellowship in 2015 in New South Wales. Bronnie's uh, project was to promote and increase numbers of women and ethnically diverse people in Australian fire agencies. And Bronnie's a station officer with Fire and Rescue New South Wales, and she's been a firefighter for 16 years. And her career has encompassed uh, many roles uh, spanning from general firefighting, rescue, operational communications, community safety and education and training. And some of you may have seen uh, Bronnie, I think also, as, uh, as you would have seen Tim on TV at some point in the last year or so, uh, Bronnie founded Girls on Fire uh, with a team of volunteers from across the emergency services. She runs Girl Fire Camps and the Girls Fire Academy in New South Wales. So um, on that note, I'm going to hand over to Bron. Excellent. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for the introduction. And um, yes, Girls on Fire. I'm representing Girls on Fire today. And I apologise for the um, less than salubrious surroundings here. I'm actually engaged in an activity that has come as a result of my Churchill Fellowship. Um, and today and yesterday, I've been sailing in the Emergency Services Sailing Regatta with the first Girls on Fire team. Um, and we've just won. So I'm here <laughs> reporting to you from the, the Lake Macquarie Yacht Club. Um, and so it's, it gives me great pleasure to, to be a speaker and to share the incredible experience that the Churchill Fellowship has been in my life. When they said, like I'm sure you were here, this will change your life. And I took it with a grain of salt. Um, I now know, like it's coming up for six years on from my 2016 trip, that it absolutely has changed my life. The things that I have been able to do and leverage on the back of that research trip 
and in becoming somewhat of the subject matter expert in my field uh, has absolutely given me so many opportunities that I would never have known were possible when I wrote that application back in 2014. I actually had applied for a Churchill Fellowship two years prior, and um, but it was for a topic that I wasn't passionate about. I got some advice that this was going to be the next thing that the fire and emergency services sector needed. It was e-learning, but I didn't feel it in my home. So when I next applied into an area that I had been passionate about, I was growing my passion in, and I had so much lived experience and I had so much ability to share my findings, um, I then was successful. So my Churchill Fellowship happened in 2016. I was a 2015 fellow and it was to investigate and research the most common recruitment strategies to attract and retain and promote a diverse workforce in the fire and emergency services. The firefighting sector has been traditionally male dominated, built on the systems of old England, which has been great and fit for purpose up until a time that our communities are so much more diverse and therefore there's a need for the fire services and any public service agency to be able to make better connections with their community by reflecting the diversity that's in the community. So I set about researching three types of recruitment strategies that world's best practice were looking at and implementing to try to recruit and retain a diverse workforce. These three strategies were quotas and government sanctioned targets. Uh, they were targeted recruitment and social change programs. So everyone has heard of quotas and trying to get diversity that way. Uh, and obviously there's a lot of pushback around doing that and particularly in cultures that are very strong to the norm, people are afraid of that. Um, and also because it's, it sounds a lot to people that you're lowering standards in order to achieve an amount. So I traveled to eight countries in eight weeks. It was epic. Uh, and I went to countries, <clears throat> excuse me, such as Hong Kong, Japan and India to look at their quotas and government sanctioned targets. And even though in those places I knew I probably wasn't going to find out a lot of information that was relevant for the Australian Fire Service, it was very relevant in terms of how it impacted culture and what the other firefighters thought about bringing more women in. Uh, it was also really interesting to look at those countries' recruitment systems and because that's what we find when we start to look at gender inequities in services and, and organisations such as the fire sector is that we, we just see that some of the systems that have been built that were fit for purpose previously, do, they're, they're unintentionally excluding women, Aboriginal people, culturally and linguistically diverse and so that's where they, these systems need to change and that's where a quota or a government sanctioned target helps address that system. I also looked at targeted recruitment programs and that's where progressive fire services such as what I found in the UK, Sweden and France use to attract the diversity of their community into the workforce and this means sort of uh, leveling the playing field, putting some platforms up to assist people who might not have access to the privilege and education that that people who benefit from the system do. And so um, we, I found that to be very useful because that's how you provide pathways for Aboriginal firefighters, for women who would never know that they could be firefighters and haven't ever experienced the physicalities involved with the job. And so providing some pathways that just provide equity. Now it's not lowering standards, um, it is just providing the extra support and addressing some of the barriers in the system to those diverse demographics. I also looked at social change programs and that was sort of the collective name I gave 
to agencies or to strategies that were about changing the social perception of what a firefighter's role is, but also introducing fire and emergency services to young people. So through work experience programs, cadetships in the organisations, or girls fire camps who, that were very popular in Canada and the USA, you could totally see how this strategy was going to, in time, change the, the ways that people viewed the role of a firefighter, but also attracted a much bigger catchment. Um, and so you're teaching young people the skills, uh, sort of job ready programs and introducing to them the vocational pathways of the fire and emergency services. Uh, what, what I found generally from that trip, it was, it was too much, you know, I totally overcooked it, um, but because that's how a passionate person does things. And so there was definitely some learnings in, in that. If I could have stretched it out over a longer period of time, absolutely I would have. And, but the defining thing for me was how I positioned myself in the application and upon return of my trip for the very important implementation of your research. And I really love that the, the Churchill Trust um, really focuses on your ability to implement this research. research. Let's face it, anyone can go on a trip and find out world's best practice, but positioning yourself to be that person who has the courage to then go about utilizing and leveraging that research and evidence to then make change in the Australian fire and emergency sector is where I have now upon reflection felt that I've sort of done my best work with it. Um, the implementation has, has put me on a little bit of a pathway to spread the message far and wide that the role of a firefighter is diverse and that we no longer go to the big, hot, heavy firefighters that the old model was fit for purpose for. And because of the diversity of the jobs we go to and the role that we have and the need to collaborate, to have better resilience, to recover better from fire and emergencies means that if we have diverse teams, we are going to be better prepared. The research gave me just more of that fuel and more of that passion to really drive that implementation because it's hard. The implementation and changing 100 year old systems and cultures that are for the majority are happy with the status quo uh, it's been really challenging and so uh, i feel like what the churchill fellowship gave me in sort of subject matter expertise evidence it also gave me as much if not more in courage and conviction to be that change maker and bring about the implementation so uh I found as part of that implementation, I did spoke at conferences, I've been a guest at other fire and emergency services throughout Australasia, speaking about this process, about my learnings, about my Churchill Fellowship. And uh, I settled into where my true passion, underneath all of that passion for, for implementing my findings was the social change programs and how about we have our own girls fire program in Australia and just model that template that is so successful overseas and really try to drive for all the fire and emergency services in Australasia to get on board with this sort of mid to long term recruitment strategy to attract and retain a diverse workforce. Uh, about six months after I got back from my Churchill Fellowship, I did a six month secondment down in Melbourne at the governing body of the fire and emergency services sector, which is called AFAC, the Australasian Fire Authorities Council. And I worked on a few diversity projects there and just out of, again, the networking and the, the skills and capabilities I learned on my Churchill Fellowship, I might have had a few of them before, and that is to network, ask for things, have influence in conversations, I was able to present and get approved a business case to run a pilot girls fire program. Well, this was very exciting because uh, also on my Churchill, I had a friend help with some of the research on, on a 
key part of it. And so really realizing the value of an evidence base for anything that you're trying to convince people needs changing, I pitched for the pilot program alongside Monash University doing a research project into the, the pilot to measure the efficacy of the program and the impact that it had on participants, so the young teenage girls experiencing the camp, but also the women, female firefighters and emergency service workers who were volunteering on the program. So there was this kind of, um, you know, combined effort there and to see what the, the facilitators got out of the, the mentoring and this was very valuable research that then the agencies thought, yeah, this actually works. And so since that original pilot, that was 2018, so two years after my fellowship, things take time, things move slowly in most sectors, but definitely in the fire sector. And um, so since then, we've, we've ran a few different formats of the program. We've had a residential program in which we've partnered with the YMCA um, through the bushfires and COVID, we pivoted and ran single day and um, two day, uh, day only programs. And we found that we could be mobile and take the program out regionally so that often in regional areas where kids really need the opportunities and especially young women, we could take the program and we could gather in volunteers from the, the services um, to participate on the program. And uh, what I found was people, you know, this idea, I, it wasn't my idea to start with. I just kind of discovered on my church or fellowship and then just through all the conversations, the amount of support, sponsors, um, government grants, people believing in this as a program has sort of launched it in a way that I did not expect. So, um, yeah, that's... Um, that's pretty much in a nutshell has been the the implementation. I, I still speak at conferences about how now this social change program is doing just that. Uh, for example, we were in Brewarrina last May during Reconciliation Week, and um, that was an opportunity to take it into regional New South Wales in a predominantly Aboriginal community uh, area and we had 32 mostly Aboriginal girls learning everything from the fire and emergency services through to all the cultural learning aspects, how to make fire in the traditional way, how to throw a boomerang and a spear, how to make Johnny cakes on the fire, how to work together in a team. Um, and it was, it was really quite, um, it was a game changer, to be honest, to see the impact of this program in the regional areas uh, and so now I'm setting up a strategic plan to then take this program throughout Australia into other jurisdictions. Uh, let's see, so um, the unexpected part of my Churchill Fellowship, uh, apart from now seeing the implementation take off in ways to, to build this incorporated not-for-profit charity that now is has attracted sponsorship and funding to run more programs. That was pretty unexpected, to be honest. But the community of practice globally that I was able to generate, I did one thing that I thought was, was <laughs> pretty smart in that I used some of my money to have some help with the sort of social media and marketing aspect to, to create that community of practice. And as I went around, I loaded everyone into it. I connected all these people, all these change makers and influencers in fire services around that tour to work together because that's how, you know, everyone was having their hard efforts in, in isolation, but bringing those hard efforts together and sharing the stories and the, the progress, but the challenges, which were all pretty similar, enabled those change makers to, to feel that the collective energy and to go on to make more change in their organisations and their sectors. So that community of practice is still very much alive today. There's now quite a few of those global social media groups to do with fire and emergency services and, and for gender, uh, and I still leverage that today. Uh, I had 
um, a job a couple of years ago as a manager for inclusion at Fire and Rescue. And I leveraged that community of practice so much when it came to things like you know, a new maternity policy that was no longer fit for purpose in the organisation. How What we do then with pregnant firefighters and giving them meaningful work when they can't be on a fire truck, uh, so easy to just jump onto one of those networks that you that have built rapport and trust with and share that information. And um, I certainly think that's something that Churchill Fellows do and learn is that it's about that collaboration and creating the synergy of people that care about the same things around the world, working together and sharing that information in order to make change. What would I do differently? I think I mentioned that earlier is that I would take longer. I can't remember, um, maybe it needed to be in that time, but um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would go again and, and go longer and go to different places but you also have to make it manageable and and uh, one thing that I remember doing was honing the focus area from big broad recruitment and cultural change in the fire and emergency services down to you know recruitment strategies because there's so much just in a honed focused area um, and yeah so that was that was really very important part of it and in doing that I actually got feedback from people on my application how does that look you know from different sources uh, the best thing about being a Churchill fellow well the best thing about being a Churchill fellow is that you're a Churchill fellow and it is enough like it this you, you don't even need to say anymore uh, the people who don't know what a Churchill fellow is then you get this other great opportunity and opening to explain a little bit about this amazing program that you got to participate in and where it's taken your life. Um, when people do know that you're a Churchill Fellow, you're a Churchill Fellow. And uh, I have loved that you are, you know, you are part of something that is leads your resume that is a reference. It's a, it's a status, it's a fraternity. Um, and I was never comfortable with being a subject matter expert, but now, you know, I I can be a subject matter expert. Even I don't have to be have academic research. I can be a, a passionista about it all, and that's what people remember. That's what people need when you are a change agent. And so, being a Churchill Fellow has has meant that is that I took time out I jumped through some hoops I leveraged what I cared most about and still care most about and um, with the help of the Churchill Trust turned it into an opportunity to be more of an influencer and uh, and make real change in the sector that I love so I I think that's all I apologize I don't have slides and there might have been a few more things to address there so I, I can either um, answer them now Adam or I'll pick them up in the Q&A. Well let's, let's move to the Q&A and thank you Bronnie that was great um, I like no slides no slides is good so I'm sure, I'm sure people um, you know love the authenticity of your approach and, and that was good so we haven't got too many questions um, Catherine I hope you're still um, online um, good question. What costs are eligible? Is it only travel related costs? Can we claim a stipend or claim pay for the travel period? So um, probably I could have explained that. Um, the Churchill Fellowship, uh, when we, if you're successful, we cover the, all the uh, travel costs. So flights, um, insurance, you're given an allowance that is generous and covers your accommodation and your um, you know, food and other living allowances. Um, so that's all, all covered. You know, it's the average um, value of a church or fellowship somewhere around twenty-eight to thirty thousand um, dollars. So you know, they're, they're quite well, well funded. Um, if there is uh, a course you want to do, that can be something you apply for as well. Um, so. Uh, Rachel's asked a couple of questions. One is, can you change your application after you've submitted? Um, it's a bit hard, I think, doing this written, so I'll answer it a few different ways. 
So if you accidentally submit it and you think, oh, I need to get it back, contact us and we can um, probably unsubmit it for you so you can make some more changes. Um, if you uh, mean once you've been um, interviewed and successful, uh, you can't really make big changes, but you can uh, you know, make small changes to your itinerary. And that's to be expected. You know, you might find after you've been awarded that some of the people you want to meet with or organisations you want to meet with are no longer um, available. Uh, you can't make sort of wholesale changes to the countries because that, that can be quite um, expensive. We obviously have to cost your fellowship out at the point that we award it. Um, so if you had a four week um, itinerary to New Zealand, you want to change that to an eight week itinerary to New York, um, that's probably not going to be so possible. Um, but you can make some little tweaks. So hopefully that's, um, that's useful for you. And I think Bronnie answered, um, got in quickly and typed an answer to a couple of questions. So uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, listening to the speakers, it seems that the focus of the study can change during the travel. Um, so like that's a good one. And maybe Tim or Bronnie, you might want to put your cameras on and, and, and talk to this one as well. I think, you know, it's quite often, or common for people to say, you don't know what you don't know. So until you get there and meet with an organization, perhaps you do find your focus shifts a little bit and I think that's fairly natural. So Tim or Bronnie might have a view on that. Sure, uh, I had mine planned out before I went that I was gonna narrow the focus into three recruitment strategies. So I actually did a fair bit of the research before I went to find out what what everyone was doing overseas and then grouped them into those types of strategies so that then when I was on the trip, I was very clear about I'm here because this is the strategies that they have. There were different things that popped up in terms of the cultural reaction to the strategies when I was there, but um, it's sort of important to go in with a narrow focus, but also with an openness to where it might take you, I guess, is the best way to answer that. Okay, and Tim, sorry, I think your camera's not on, but did you want to add anything? Yeah, thanks, Adam. I'm uh, having some technical issues. Camera won't turn on, but that's fine. Um, probably it's not for me. It wasn't the focus changed. It was actually my perception changed and what I understood, what I believe the reality to be changed. It was the change from the Australian perspective, and this was the key part the fellowship allowed me to do, what I thought was truth in homicide investigation um, because it was siloed in an Australian perspective uh, was flipped on its head going internationally. And it was, as I indicated, the change from thinking about that, that hard and fast technical aspects, resourcing aspects, caseload aspects and the like, as opposed to a social aspect where contract of trust became a real clear um, performance um, indicator for me, that's what changed as opposed to the focus, if that makes sense. Uh, no, that's good. Thanks, Tim. That's, that's very helpful. Um, so another question is, how did you best network with international organisations? Um, so I, I, I'm taking that question as in, um, you know, when you were working out who you wanted to meet with and why, uh, Bronnie or Tim, did you have something to offer there in terms of how you went about networking with those organisations overseas? Bronnie? Uh, sure. Um, how, I, how I went about um, networking was I just grew my confidence as I went along because people are, are um, pretty much interested in the fact that you're travelling from Australia to research you know that this field and so people love the opportunity to talk about their service or themselves and um so i just you you got to tell yourself to be bold to go out there and i just lined up lots of interviews um and then it just happens quite organically when you go in and have lots of interviews lined up and questions that then are open and and you go in with an intent to link people with something else that they they're curious about what we're doing as well uh so i think the the key there is just to be bold you have to get out there and 
and drive it 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 won't no one's going to come and knock on your hotel or, or ring your international sim and say oh we heard that you're over from australia so ahead of time sending emails planning ahead to the next country sending emails to that picking you know having a sim card in each country and calling people um, a few times like in india where it didn't work how it worked at home where you would send messages and emails there was none of that um, it was catching a tuk tuk uh, no wait they called something else there i can't think of it right now um, and then just going to the fire station and sometimes the you know the universe just rolls things your way and i turned up to a fire station up in Jaipur in Rajasthan and I went there because I'd seen a story on the internet about um, teenage brides being sell, you know, sold off and that's why they were bringing the government quota to change the social system for women. And uh, it just happened to be their recruitment day at this fire station and so there are tons of mostly men and then a few women but then i also got to meet the women who were the female firefighters of rajasthan that i had seen on youtube clips and there was no booking that in that just was serendipity moments which happens when you put it out there of what you're doing you know for for the greater good things come your way so be bold and and expect infinite possibility Prepare yourself for anything. I like it. Um, Craig's asked how important it is to have identified specific people to speak with when traveling. Now, I think from an um, application point of view, it's actually really important that you've identified specific organizations at, at least and potentially people, um, you know, because we're going to want you to tell us, look, I want to go and meet with X organization or Y person because they're doing this thing and I want to learn about it. So, if, if you don't have that kind of degree of um, specifics, then uh, it's going to be difficult to convince the selection panel that um, that you really have a clear idea of what you're doing. And it's, it is going to be competitive and people will have applications that are very clear. And I think Tim um, wanted to add something there. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Adam. It's, um, you, you, you won't have you won't have a lot of time. I agree with what Bronnie says, but you won't have a lot of time to leave things to chance unless you've really structured up a fair majority of what you're going to go and do because the time will fly. So I had a very clear structure about who I needed to see. And it was then that that really rich piece that each jurisdiction I went to where I had the core bit that I need to look at then allowed the flexibility to perhaps then branch left, right, forward, back. Um, which is like what Bronnie's talking about. You, but you must have that core piece settled, otherwise you'll run around in circles like a head. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Um, Catherine uh, asks, can you use any of the funding to implement the research findings? Well, you won't have any left, I think, is, is the answer. But if you look at my background, impact uh, funding, uh, we're doing some pretty cool stuff now. Um, the fellowship uh, itself has grown. It's not just that overseas research experience, which is amazing in itself. But when you come back, we offer um, people who've you know submitted their report and finished that aspect or that phase of the fellowship, additional funding support to help you disseminate um, your findings. And then if it comes down to implementation, we're, we're just in the process now. We've got applications open for Churchill Fellows um, who are at that point of wanting to implement something that they've um, learned or that their recommendations from their fellowship, we're, we're offering um, funding now um, initially for a pilot program uh, for just that purpose. So Catherine, that's, that's the end we have in mind is the impact that comes from this fellowship. So there would be potentially additional funding for you on, on your return um, on the assumption we continue this pilot, which we're pretty excited about. Someone else has asked, uh, how important is, you, is it that you have the ability or the influence necessary to enact change through your uh, church fellowship research findings? And is this something that can be built upon on return? Um, and you might not have those extensive networks now. So look, I think, yes, uh, you, you know, you definitely will build your network through a church fellowship. It, it'll be amazing. Um, you'll find that your networks will, will um, blossom. However, uh, look, it, it is a competitive uh, process. So other people who are applying are going to describe in their application and if they get an interview, they'll be telling our selectors uh, how they're going to share the findings and how they're gonna make some sort of impact. So you do need to give that some thought. 
um, that's going to be quite important. Possibly your referees might be able to back you up a bit in, in, in that way. So, um, you know, we don't expect you to necessarily, you know, be the one leader in your field, but certainly you need to think about who are the kind of key stakeholders, who are the people that, that you'll approach when you come back and, and give us a sense that you know what you'll do uh, with your findings when, when you return. Um, Rachel's asked whether Tim or Bronnie will be prepared to share the email addresses for some guidance or assistance. Well, look, um, all of our Churchill Fellows, uh, almost without doubt, without fail, uh, are happy to engage with people and give back. If you go to our website, uh, you'll find um, Tim uh, and you'll find uh, Bronnie and you'll find uh, many, many other fellows. You can search people by state, uh, topic, um, field, keyword search. And you'll see under their profile, there'll be a contact form. You can fill that out. And uh, the team here will make contact with that fellow and check that they're happy to be in touch. And then they'll you know, arrange that contact for you. So um, you can do that. Also, you'll find on our website on the front page, down the bottom of the front page, there's a map of Australia. And we have alumni associations in each state and territory in the capital cities. Um, and there'll be members as well uh, in regional areas. So you can contact them as well and they're always keen to offer support and advice. Um, last two questions, um, Craig's asked if you know the uh, area of study has maybe four or five uh, various areas, is it better to focus on one or two and leave the others to do later post travel? Mm, I think um, that's kind of up to you, but uh, really if, if you are trying to present an application that's spreading yourself too thin and, and there's many, many different strands to it, um, it might not be the strongest application compared to someone that's got a really laser-like focus on a particular issue or topic. So uh, I think have a think about what will make the strongest, uh, most compelling um, application. Um, and the last question is, what is your combined experience of people overseas to be ready to meet and not change or not be available, uh, which will mess up your time schedule? Look, I think you know what we tend to observe is when people um, apply for their fellowship, they don't really tend to make contact with people and lock in those meetings, because that's a bit hard when you don't have a fellowship. So you might make some very early exploratory contact to see if um, organisations are willing to meet with people or if individuals are willing to meet with people if they visit their country. Once you've been awarded the fellowship, you then uh, have that opportunity to really uh, work on your, um, your itinerary and start setting up those meetings. And look, from time to time, um, things change. COVID really has thrown a lot of things on its head. There's still, as you'd expect, hospitals and health organisations that just aren't open to international visitors yet. That will change over time. Uh, but you do see some of those things do change. And so before you're allowed to book your travel, you come back to us with a revised itinerary and we'll sign that off and, and then off you go. So um, yeah, it's not uncommon to see some uh, refinements and changes on that front. So on that note, it is 6.20, we've got no more questions. So um, look, thank you everyone for um, attending today and for staying on. I hope you found this uh, useful. Um, if you're applying, uh, good luck and good night.